Good afternoon, and welcome to Open Table Online Industry Series um, Into the Unknown, preparing for a festive season like no other. Normally, around this time of year, we'd all be gathered in London for this event. Uh, but obviously, given the circumstances today, we're welcoming you online. We know how busy each and every one of you are, so it means a lot to me that you're spending time out of your day with us. And I'm hopeful and fully confident that you'll be rewarded with a rich and robust conversation with our three esteemed panelists today, Roz Hellahat, Kerry O'Connor, and Alexis Gauthier. My name is Winston Lord, and I'm Open Table's Chief Evangelist. Before we get started, just wanted to run through a couple of housekeeping items. First, we've left some time at the end of the session for Q&A from the audience. So we strongly encourage you to leave questions. Um, on your screen, you should see a Q&A presentation tool, and that's where we'll go to lead them. They're anonymous, so feel free to shoot away. And like I said, we'll try and get to most of them at the end of the session. Wow. Secondly, we'll also be uh, re referencing some resources throughout the conversation. And there should be a resource link also on your screen where you can access those for more information. Let's get started. I think yesterday's news from Pfizer and BioNTech about a possible vaccine obviously is extremely welcome news. But we all knew, even with the most optimistic of timelines, that won't help us for this festive season. This festive season is going to be like no other. It's going to look different. It's going to feel different. The idea and the hope that we would have bustling dining rooms or corporate parties night after night are all but impossible during this pandemic. But that said, the joy of dining and the experience of true hospitality are not out of reach for diners. It doesn't matter if they're off premise or in the restaurant. So as you gear up for your festive season, um, we'll be sharing best practices and lessons learned from these three distinguished uh, panelists on ways to, to help uh, prepare, especially their experiences from the first lockdown. As I was putting this panel together, three names immediately came to mind. Uh, Carrie O'Connor, who's the director of food and beverage for Hotel Cafe Royale. Uh, Alexis Gauthier, who's the chef and owner of Gauthier Soho. And Roz Hellat, who owns the coal shed both in Brighton and in London, as well as a salt room in London. Why did I think about them? They share uh, three common qualities. First, they exude hospitality, and you'll see that today. Second, they possess an entrepreneurial spirit that has really served them well during this pandemic. The idea of having to reinvent themselves and iterate um, is in their innate blood. And third, they simply have this air of optimism that is uh, contagious. Uh, they always see the glass half full. And I got to tell you, for me at least, that's something I really need these days. We'll also touch on a couple of insights from our most recent dining survey. So uh, first off, let me just do a round of quick intros. Um, Carrie, do you want to kick us off? Hello. Welcome <laughs> to everyone. <laughs> Would you like to say a little about yourself and, um, and Hotel Cafe okay. Royal? So sure. I am the director of food and beverage at Hotel Cafe Royal. Um, I have been here for three years. Um, Hotel Cafe Royal, um, we've changed our culinary um, experiences from the from three years ago to now. So we now have um, three restaurants. We have two bars. I also look after in-room dining events and all of the staff food within the hotel. Obviously, this is a very different um, experience for me at the moment in the fact that the hotel is still open. Um, we are open for long-term guests and corporate guests. Um, but we're running about just under 10% occupancy. So it's a very strange place to be in the hotel when there is very little guests around. However, that said, we are doing, you know, trying to count the box in terms of innovations for how we can accommodate the guests that we have in, you know, what can we be doing differently? So that is just a very quick overview of, of what I do and uh, where I am. Thanks, Kerry. Uh, Alexis, would you like to go next? Yes, yeah, so um, uh, as you introduced myself already, I'm Alexis Gauthier. So I run the um, a beautiful um, um, a restaurant in uh, in Soho, in London, called Gauthier Soho. Uh, up until last year, it was a very uh, successful um, 
operations, um, plenty of small private dining rooms, um, uh, restaurants with um, well over 100% cover yield. So it, it, it was a fantastic restaurant to run in the, in the, in the center of, uh, of Soho and some center of London, and as far as I'm concerned, center of my world. And obviously, uh, first wave of COVID and, uh, and then starting again in September and then second wave of COVID has had um, just like everybody else in the industry and in many other um, uh, industries, a massive impact. Uh, but it, it really tested our, uh, uh, how, how, good, <laughs> um, uh, how good we are and how optimistic we are about the, about the future and how we can actually, um, you know, now bec becoming a specialist of uncertainty. Um, I think this is, this, is, this is where we are here today. And, um, and, um, and I really feel like um, uncertainty can be, I mean, we learn from everything. But um, this is teaching us a lot, and, and I can't wait to share with you what, what, how, how, how digested the uncertainty uh, I've been uh, presented with currently. <laughs> Thanks, Alexis. Arise, do you want to uh, round us out? Um, yes, good afternoon. Hi. Uh, my name is Razak Helalat. I'm the managing director and founder of the two coal shed restaurants. Uh, the original one opened uh, almost a decade ago in Brighton. Uh, we've also got the Salt Room restaurant here, uh, which is a, a, a fish restaurant, which is right on uh, Brighton seafront. And we opened the Coal Shed at One Tower Bridge in 2017. Um, all specializing in cooking either meat or fish over fire. Um, and uh, yes, and here we are. You know, we we, we only opened our London site um, at the beginning of um, October, waiting for everyone to come back, all the corporates, all the workforces to come back. And um, three days later, we had the 10 p.m. curfew. Two weeks later, we had the tier two, and then 10 days later, lockdown. So. Yeah, quite a disappointing uh, start, really, after ev everybody had uh, been there. But here we are, and uh, yeah, here we are back into the <laughs> into lockdown too. So we can only yeah. hope that this is not going to last too long. Yeah, we all hope that. Um, it's a good segue into sort of what I want to start the conversation with, which is around off-premise dining. Um, with the second lockdown, coupled with the cold weather that's coming, um, the strategy for off-premise dining becomes that much more critical for restaurateurs. Um, Alexis, I remember when we, we spoke um, a couple of weeks ago um, and you told me about the first lockdown back in the spring, you actually decided against initially doing meal kits. Um, but then you change your mind, and I think that was good news because I think you told me that the revenue of uh, the meal kits uh, helped you almost equal the revenue pre-COVID last year. It was a key to your cash flow. Um, tell me a little about sort of how you changed your mind and, and sort of what you're doing now. Yeah, I mean, um, when, the, when the first lockdown happened, I really didn't believe that uh, uh, first there was any demand from, from, from the customers. Um, and also there was anything I could do because it wasn't my specialty and uh, it wasn't something I, I, I thought would be successful, but how wrong I was. But actually it's not, I wasn't wrong that um, um, I couldn't do it. I wasn't wrong, I was wrong because I did not think that actually I could, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't sit, I didn't put myself uh, instead of my customers, meaning that I was just at home and thinking, oh no, no! If I was a customer, I will, I will hate to have a, a, a box full of stuff from from Gautier Soho because it's never the same. What we want is to go to this restaurant in Soho, enjoy the light, enjoy the service, enjoy the, the, the specialness of the place. And and so I was really, really, really not convinced that something that will actually work. Then we reopen in September. Then second lockdown. But 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 but. <laughs> as always, and I think it's so important for, for, for people is to look at what the competition is doing and what, how, how the, uh, the industry is adapting. And some people are better uh, at, than others to, to, to actually adapt and to, to reflect. And there was the, uh, an amazing restaurant in Birmingham who actually decided to start uh, selling in boxes um, uh, a combination of seven to eight uh, curry um, uh, every week. 
and I and and I just got hooked to it over the summer. I just I just thought that was the most amazing idea. And suddenly I wasn't just a restaurateur. I was a customer at home, being excited to receive this book every Friday and to share this book to my family over the weekend. So I said, look, I've created you know a restaurant, and I think it's in subconscious of a lot of, uh, of 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 people who have been to my restaurant. They remember their birthday. They remember their uh, the party, a meal of two, romantic or whatever, and actually, they are at home. They can't, um, they can't have it. They can't move, but the dreams they still have in their head. So I think, I think I need to to, to cross those two points. Them wanting to relive the experience and me being able to, uh, you know, cash on that and trying to make, um, trying to make. So, so we went in, with my team. We, we we started to be as creative as possible and trying to think what would people want to eat, and we we. We are very much into um, uh, vegan vegan food here at Gautier So, and um, and we felt like we 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 had a niche. So the combination of vegan food, um, trying to recreate the specialness that makes restaurants so successful, and trying to um, um, uh, condense that into a box, and 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 obviously through the marketing we are doing and through the um, uh, our long list of customers we have, we send them some really tempting emails. That they couldn't resist, and um, and and here we were, you know, taking maybe 100 boxes a week, and then second with 200, and then having to stop because we were at full capacity, you know, selling 300, 350 boxes a week, actually transforming into taking as much money um, uh, in the boxes than we would have been in the restaurant. So that that really is um, uh, that was really comforting for for me as a business owner and and worrying about the, the cash flow, but also. Yep. For my staff to be able to see that uh, I wasn't going to just stay there and, and wait for things to pass, showing them that being creative, being proactive, and uh, and being optimistic, and and always thinking about capitalizing of all the hard work we have done in the past in the restaurant and trying to 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 upsell from that. I, I think that that's that's what we did, and uh, and uh, and. Uh, you know, we are right in the middle of preparing our delivery for Friday, so I took, I took two hours to review, but uh, it's it's now a lot of work, but it's really exciting, and, and I can't wait to deliver Bochiso to, to to my customers nationwide in Friday. That's great. Raz, um, I know when we talked, actually, you sort of dove right in to meal kits. It was something that um, you didn't have an e-commerce website set up. You didn't have delivery partners identified. You didn't even have the packaging. I don't think you'd ever done sort of takeaway before, but you said, hey, the minute the lockdown came, you were going to go full in with uh, meal kits. Tell me a little more about your your story and sort of the lessons learned for the other operators out there that are thinking about it, but don't have any of the other assets that you didn't have either when you started. Um, yeah, I mean, we're completely new to it. We just threw ourselves right in the deep end and um, I, I wish I'd, uh, I'd heard of Shopify before, but uh, I hadn't. So we kind of used the tool that we knew, really. And uh, we, I just felt I had to kind of do something. I'm not really used to being kind of sat around doing nothing. I've always been, you know, I've, I've always liked life in thick gear, should we say, kind of a busy bee going around. But I also felt, I don't know, we felt almost helpless at that time. It was such a unique moment. Um, in time and just to be sat at home um, and just didn't feel the right thing to do. And I knew that human beings in general, we're social creatures, you know, we love celebrating, we love that enjoyment of life. And I just think, you know, I wanted ways that, you know, that could be some, some we can have some sort of normality, some sort of connection to, um, to how things work. And, you know, I felt doing this, um, people could still celebrate their birthdays, their weddings, their anniversary, because obviously all these things were still going to happen, um, even in lockdown. So I just felt that everybody still wanted that sense to kind of forget about what was going on and still being able to you know, look forward to, the, to it being a date night or a Friday, the weekend, and having that difference between the weekend um, and uh, the start of the week. Um, so yes, we we opened that up. We just 
we, I don't think we spent as much as we could have done on our packaging and the branding. I think it was a little bit uh, rough around the edges, but I think we made it look pretty good by the time we got stickers and some nice little tags and everything. And trying to find everything very quickly was um, was uh, was quite stressful. And I must say, this time round, we've certainly learned our lessons to try and keep things a bit simpler. I think last time was a little bit chaotic. <laughs> <laughs> to tell you the truth, but yeah. especially when you're not, set up, I think that 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 just overtakes everything, really. But uh, I think this time around, certainly having everything a lot, you know, we, we found a different platform um, to to use, which now works with our tills. You know, there, there are lots of uh, which is called Food to Go, which is part of uh, the Access Group. So we've we already used one of their other um, systems for this sort of stock taking. Um, so these all talk and, you know, just the back end of it is just so much easier, so much smoother. And it's just having the right tools. But, you know, at the same time, you can still do it with other, the wrong tools, but it just makes life very, very difficult. <laughs> would, would you recommend, so for operators that haven't done meal kits yet and are looking to dive right in, would you tell them to sort of go right in and learn along the way, along with the customers, like, have them part of the journey or try and figure out before you actually launch your milk kits? Like, would you have done the packaging a little better and waited before you launched it in hindsight? I think in hindsight, yes. I think like anything you want, you know, you always want things to be perfect from the start, but I just felt by the time we'd done that R and D and everything else, you know, that we could have wasted, we could have, that could have taken anything up to a month. And I just couldn't stand the thought of, not get going sooner so that's why we kind of just delved right in and ultimately you know ultimately as long you know we let the food do the talking but i think if i had it the first way around i think i would have tried to make my life a little bit easier <laughs> and find better tools really yep <laughs> but you Curry, know um, you yeah. to... that's great carrie yeah. uh, we're talking about celebrations and, and sort of that's what dining out and uh, takeaway is all about. Cakes and bubbles, you actually did take away prior to the pandemic. You thought that sweets, you know, obviously a form of celebration were a great way to travel. They would travel pretty well for you. Um, but you're hesitant to experiment with some savory dishes, I think. I don't think you, I think you focus only on cakes and bubbles and sort of the sweets. Um, has your thinking changed with, with COVID and the second lockdown? And if so, why and, and what are you doing? So yes, before um, even the first lockdown, I had um, takeaway available in cakes and bubbles. I had had all my packaging done, but during the first lockdown, we didn't do any takeaway or delivery whatsoever. So when we reopened and we came in, we reopened in September, we saw this massive increase in footfall straight into cakes and bubbles. And it was all people celebrating and everyone was opting to the, the real true experience. So rather than having one or two dishes, they were going for the full experience. As we came into the second lockdown, and it very much touches um, on what the other panellists have said, is that everybody still really wants to go out and celebrate. Everyone is still having a birthday. Everyone is still having a wedding anniversary. So what we decided to do was to make that experience into a takeaway offer where you could experience the whole afternoon tea in cakes and bubbles at home so hmm. it was rather than it just being a takeaway and it being transactional when you either get this delivered or you collect it you get a card inside it explains how you eat all the food you know what is the process so very much you know where you'd have that waiter who would be guiding you through we followed it through with um instructions for our guests to understand and it and really to kind of enjoy the experience at home um in terms of this working very well on some of our third party, third party websites this has gone down incredibly well but launching the savory i think this is where i was probably behind in terms of setting up the same platforms to go through my savory dishes for my cafe royal kitchen you know, trying to liaise with the likes of Uber or Deliver Eats or, you know, any of those third party websites. I find that that has been quite difficult. And where I had those platforms in place for cakes and bubbles, opening a whole new entity has been, I would say, very time consuming. Yep. 
Yep. It sounds like uh, meal kits are probably the preference over delivery, just in the sense of you own most of the packaging and the delivery and the, the, the essence of hospitality. You can sort of bring forward as much of the hospitality that you usually give to them in the restaurant through a meal kit. Um, but you're not the only three doing meal kits. So I'd love to hear yeah. from each of you sort of some of the things that you're doing to sort of make your stand out because this is a much more difficult transaction than making a reservation at an open table. An open table, you just go to our app, you just click for a time, you find the restaurant, you click a time and you're all set. But for meal kit, you've got many steps along the way um, to attract the diner, but then make sure that they don't just leave your meal kit in the cart. So tell me a little more about what you're doing to capture capture these diners. Sure, shall I shall I start? <laughs> because I, I think we remember. I, I remember we did discuss this the other day with, and um, and I I, I, I think that the, the reason why, for example, for for us, we decided to go for meal kit rather than waiting in the kitchen for delivery orders to come through and to send it to our customers, it's because. Um, 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 I, I think key in business is to first concentrate on the on the customers who know you. Um, obviously, over the years we had accumulated a, a long list of uh, customers details through um, Open Table, for example, <laughs> and which uh, which uh, which um, you know gives us a lot of uh, a lot of information about who is potentially going to uh, to actually um, uh, buy our product. So. We thought about them first because they are the most important customer. They know our product already, and perhaps it's going to be much easier to start selling to them because obviously, hopefully, they had a, a nice experience in the restaurants. And so, what we did for us is to try to to create a product um, very, very, very easy to understand in terms of package. Something that, as I said again, you know, uh, encapsulates the spirit of the restaurant, and and in order to make a product which is impossible to resist. And there was a lot of things in this impossible to resist product I was hoping to, to bring to the customers. First is really reflect the restaurant, the spirit of the restaurant, and what we are known for, i.e. for us, it's a vegan, French, creative cooking. Secondly, is you look at the menu and you say, oh yeah, that's something I'd like to eat. So it's to create some dishes that are impossible, again, to resist. We had this information from the restaurant because we know what people like, what people don't like. So it was very important to be not too creative and to make sure that we could actually think that we knew people would go for it. And then after it's creating a website or you know, a purchase platform, for us, we use Shopify. We have been using Shopify for many years, and we know how to make a product stand and how to grab their, their, their attention and try to make them um, um, purchase almost um, impulsively. Because when they are on their mobile phone and they are thinking about taking their wife or their boyfriend to a restaurant, they go on, for example, uh, open table, and it's very easy to, to click to choose a restaurant. Oh yeah, I'm dreaming of going to this restaurant, this restaurant. Boom, let's book a table for two at eight o'clock. We want you to do the same. We want you them to say, oh yeah, yeah, you know what? Friday night, this is what we are gonna get. And bang, and capturing this impulsive buying. That was really, really, really important because I don't want them to go on the problem with, uh, for example, I have feared if I went on another platform, which put me in competition with other restaurants, they would say, oh yeah, but maybe on Friday night, perhaps forget about uh, the, the vegan, maybe we should have, uh, I don't know, a uh, Thai, or we should have a uh, pizza, or we should have a, uh... and so it was very important that, first I talked to my guests, which I know, they know me, I said, this is my product, buy from me. And subconsciously, they are gonna think, well, you know what, we are gonna help this guy too. And that's very important because I also play on their feelings of poor restaurants, you know, maybe they are struggling and everything. So there is all this, everything that comes into the, uh, the equation to make them buy. Because we, at the moment, everybody needs cash. Everybody needs to have your chase coming to their, their, their thing. And, and that was really the condition of our product and, uh, and trying to, to grab that under one roof, I think that was, uh, that's the key. That's really the key. Yeah. I think one thing you had mentioned to me that resonated with me was that every page, yeah. every step of the journey for the customer, you had really good looking pictures of your food. So it kept them engaged through the whole process. So I just thought that was great. Um, yeah, I, I think enticing the, the, the guests all the way to the moment he pressed the button where he wants to pay, it's key. It's really key. You, and you want to be in full control. I think that's that key. And, and, and in 2020, you can really be in full control with your list of customers from OpenTable, 
a platform like Shopify, which allows you to create a, 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 a shop in, in half an hour, and, and knowing your product and what your customer wants to buy. And then, and then you're set. And to be fair, the first week when we did the box, it's all, it was almost like a, a series of The Apprentice, because, you know, Alfred through the first 50 boxes, we were like, we forgot to put uh, uh, <laughs> some ingredients in the box. And, but it was so exciting. It was so exciting because the thing that I dreamed in my head, we were actually putting it into the box. And people on Friday, they were going to have this box that I dreamed and producing, reproducing, and reproducing. And, and that's, that, that was really exciting. So you know, I'm not going to say I love the lockdown number two, but really exciting. <laughs> yep. Raz, I, I remember our conversations too. It's all about exceeding expectations. Um, tell me a little more about what you meant about that. <clears throat> um, well, I think it's easy to just do to do this and to do it in a way that sometimes a takeaway it can leave you a little bit flat when you've had it. And I guess what we wanted was to kind of have the same effect when people were coming into our restaurant and in and, and, and that terms of in the restaurants we mainly either cook meat or fish and you know and especially and specialize in cooking over fire so it's like how you and especially the culture that's known for its steaks was always like how are we going to get that back at home because that's a completely different um concept so we spent a lot of time just working on dishes that were that we could um, that we could really concentrate on putting as much flavour uh, and putting in smokers and doing lots of processes in there that there's just been that that they could kind of get a sense of what it was like to be back in the restaurant really and just over delivering in terms of the the different garnishes the sauce the quality of the ingredients that we're going for. You know, it, it, you know, I think we went over and above the first time round. I think we, we, we complicated things. I think people were, um, I think they were blown away with it, really. I think, you know, but maybe that's a bit OTT. But I think people loved, you know, their amount of attention to detail um, <laughs> that we went through, you know, that, that, and all the dishes are sharing dishes. So we do big shoulders of smoked lamb but they'd have about 10 different bits that would come with it and which could also cause us massive problems if you forgot this one little dip as well but i think the main thing was it was, was always trying to replicate that experience in the restaurant and back at home and i think that's why we always made sure that we always still try to get the best ingredients and if not get the get even better ingredients that you could before, because obviously the supply chains for all the wholesalers um, had come short. So, you know, people were desperate to get rid of stuff. So, you know, you could get them. So there's great, there's an, an abundance of great produce out there that you could use. So we're very lucky to be able to do that really. And hopefully the customers enjoyed that. Yeah, sounds like now's not the time to cut corners. I mean, you'd think when, uh, during a pandemic, uh, cutting corners might be the way to go, but it sounds like you don't believe that. No, absolutely not. I think if ever there was a time that you have to step up your game, I think now is the time, you know, just over deliver on the food, the produce, the service, the care, the love, the attention to detail, that warmth and hospitality is uh, is ever more because I think, you know, that it's it's such such a hard time and I think you've got to leave that lasting impression on people and I think people will notice that. <laughs> That actually, when they cut that piece of meat, they'll be going, oh, my God, that is just, you know, and people will remember that and they'll dream of that and they'll want to come back to it rather than go, yes, you know, we've had, we've had in the past from before. And, it's, and it is. You don't want it to be a disappointment. You want it to be a celebration. And I think that's, and that, that only goes by, you know, going over and above. Um, and, and that's how you get that, really. That's great. Kerry, I see you nodding furiously in, in agreement. Um, tell me a little more about sort of your philosophy as well. Sounds like it's similar. I think it's very similar. You know, now is the time that, you know, people really look forward to something special because it, when, you, when it gets taken away, I think in that first lockdown, everyone was, I cannot wait to go back to a restaurant. I cannot wait to be back with other people. 
And if you work in hospitality, the worst thing is, is not being able to talk to people, is to, to have that engagement, to talk about food, to talk about their day. And I think, you know, very much for us, when we came out of the, the first lockdown, we managed to rebook all of the guests that we were unable to accommodate because of lockdown. We offered, you know, them a, an incentive to book back. But as soon as those people came back, you know, everyone asked me, you know, was there a, a worry about people coming into, you know, the restaurant again? You know, we all put our procedures in place, but most people were just so happy to be back out and, you know, to be living those experience of being back in a restaurant rather than being at home for six months watching Netflix and ordering the odd takeaway once in a while. And I think those special moments where I had a food box um, delivered, I thought I would, you know, join everybody else on, you know, cooking at home. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. And it made my weekend. It was something to talk about. It was something to do. So I think I'm very much on the same page as my other panellists because, you know, we all miss hospitality desperately when it goes. Yep. Um, a couple more questions on sort of off-premise. So we've been really focused on meal kits, but... Um... You know, there's other ways to engage the customers and other ways to provide the hospitality off premise. Um, we talked about some of them. That, would you all like to sort of talk about some of the other things you're thinking about this time around? Um, you mean, you mean in, in terms of keeping in touch with uh, with uh, with our guests? Yeah, beyond yeah. meal kits, right? Or what other things are you thinking about beyond um, beyond meal kits to stay engaged with your guests? Well, I think it's uh, first thing. It's vital to stay engaged with your guests. During lockdown, whether it's for a week, six months, two years, I think. Um, um, it's you're, not you're, years. Yeah, that they, they need to know that you are not um, just uh, in hibernation. You are actually um, making the most of the time, and uh, and even more now. Yeah. People, are, are, I mean, I found that um, the first lockdown, I wrote to all of my guests to tell them that you know we will be waiting for them and we will be thinking about. Um, new recipes and new ingredients, and uh, and I said at the bottom of my email, uh, if you want to, um, if you want to, if you want, if you've got something to tell me or if you want to share something with me, just send me an email. My gosh, I received thousands of emails. I didn't even think my guests will engage with me, but it's just show that, it's just show that um, uh, our customers, they are just not customer. They are part of a of a, of a wide community and vital 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 to stay in touch with them and um, a little email once in a while maybe just to remind them that last year they had had their christmas party with you and it's a pity to this year you can't do it but we look forward to seeing them next year and that's this little touch because nothing that makes a massive difference and that really is the spirit of, of, of the hospitality that's why we are here it's to really look after our guests and we are not forgetting them and they need to be reminded that so on top of trying to sell them uh, home kits and trying to sell them champagne and trying to sell them wines and trying to sell them upcoming gift vouchers for when we reopen. I also sell nothing to them. I uh, just sell mm -hmm. them the spirit of the restaurant and hope as well. Um, I think it's very important to be upbeat and not to be like, uh, you know, saying, oh gosh, you know, another lockdown and I don't know if I'm going to survive. I don't think that's what they want. If anything, they need to feel like um, um, uh, there, is, there is light at the end of the tunnel and, and when the light turns back on, it will be in our restaurant. And they, they want us to be a bit, they want us to remind them that there, there will be some fantastic time ahead. That's, that's key. And that costs nothing. Yep. Uh, Razak, I know we, we talked to you, you, I think jokingly said a couple of weeks ago, food trucks. Um, but I actually think you're thinking seriously about it as we sort of got to that conversation. Tell me a little about that. I, I do think, I think that would be an amazing idea i'm not sure if i've got the time and the 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 time to to get it up and ready but certainly i think that's something if i had a food truck i would certainly be going around and you know finding little different neighborhoods to um you know to you know you're similar to these sort of meal kits that you could get ready get it all you know boxed up and you know you could just go on your different corners and your things and people come and get their two course dinners and um but I, yeah, I think you know. I think we've got to think of different ways how we can get into people's uh, homes and um, and certainly by keeping keeping in touch with them. Really, during lockdown, I tend to take over the newsletters um, 
just not not that the marketing team don't do a great job, but I just feel it, it becomes more of a personal message, and you know you kind of go through a weekly uh, a weekly update with all the um, with all the with all your customers, and I think they seem to seem to really enjoy that. Really, um, also it gives you an opportunity to get back on the floor. Obviously, when you're running the restaurant, it's very hard to kind of. Be be everywhere really, but it gives you a great opportunity to spend time with the customers, delivering it to the customers when they come to the door, catching up. And again, as soon as we've gone into lockdown, it's all the same old names I keep seeing coming back, and it is this sense of community. These people that are helping you to go through this, they're supporting you. They're phoning up to say, "Are you are you guys doing this again?" And and it's um, and again, it feels like this real cuddle that they're putting around you and saying, look, we've, we've, we're there with you. You know, we're, we're going to share this journey. You're going to give us your amazing food and we're going to exchange and we're going to get through this. And, it's, and, and it feels very touching that there, yeah. is that there is that support there, really, because sometimes you forget, but at the end of the day, you wouldn't be anything without them, really. So, it's, yeah, um, yeah it's, it's, it's very touching. Really. But on the food truck thing, yes, I think... I think if there's lockdown three, then we might have to get ready for that one. Gary, <laughs> <laughs> did you have anything to add on this before we uh, start moving on? Uh, sure. Um, I think in terms of our communication, very similar, but also we haven't um, we haven't kind of stopped Christmas. So we're really talking to our guests about what we have planned for Christmas. Um, I have moved dates around, but we still have, you know, a live theatre show and live jazz that we've planned in. So we haven't kind of cancelled Christmas until it's being cancelled. Please don't. But also, and the, in the, <laughs> until we know, you know, it's going ahead. But also in the back of my mind, I'm thinking if, you know, we do come out of lockdown and we go into tier three and, you know, Christmas is restricted, I am kind of thinking that if all of us were friends and we said, look, December is off, let's all catch up in January. I'm very much planning ahead of thinking that actually, maybe I extend Christmas into January and actually it won't be dry January. It will actually be catch up. We're now allowed to go out January and actually we could see a real peak. So I am, you know, in, in my mind thinking I might extend my afternoon tea, my Christmas afternoon tea right through into January just to capture um, people who are unable to catch up with their friends and family and actually postpone it. And let's say we can do it in January. I, I love that. And I love that because it's a great segue into what I want to talk about next, which is uh, in the restaurant dining. Uh, let's all hope and, and keep our fingers crossed that the lockdown will be lifted in early December so we can salvage some of the holiday season, festive season for some of that in person, which is what you all uh, excel at. I um, want to give you some insights on a couple of uh, feedback we got from diners. We did a survey of over 4,000 um, UK uh, respondents uh, to our survey, dining survey. A couple of things I found interesting. Over half of the 4,000 respondents said they really appreciate dining out more now than they did before, before the pandemic. About half of them said they plan to dine out more for the upcoming festive season. So that goes right into sort of extending festive season to January. Um, and over three quarters of the diners planning to dine out in December will be looking for a special dining experience like a set menu or a tasting menu or a special offer. So clearly there's a hunger, um, excuse the pun, um, I'm just a, a punny guy, and a new appreciation for what you and other operators do best, and that's hospitality. Um, you know, I've heard countless stories of diners who have ventured out for uh, a night out um, and had the most tremendous experience. They were able to forget about all the troubles in the world, the kids at home, the parents they're taking care of, whatever it may be, and escape when they went to the restaurant. Unfortunately, I've also heard of a couple other diners who have gone to restaurants, luckily none of yours, um, and just had the opposite experience, where they didn't feel safe. They felt crunched up against another uh, uh, table and it was clear that the restaurant was just worried about the bottom line and not worried about the the diner safety or their employees safety um, and they vowed never to return so tell me a little about what you did going into lockdown one um, and, uh, to sort of make guests feel comfortable when they came so they could forget about everything else and are there any other things you're doing now 
to make it even more safe for them as you come out of lockdown too. Um, when uh, when when we reopen in September, I I, uh, I don't have a lot of uh, space in my restaurant because it's a very old building in the center of so um, five floors, small rooms, and so I had to um, I had to create some some sort of little cocoon, thinking that um, it would be um, it would be it would be sufficient. Um, we 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 went to Switzerland and um, and we we, we bought this. Um, Hospital grade, beautiful drapping that fall from the uh, from the ceilings. That's part of the gastronomic experience of my restaurants. Is uh, you need to have those kind of beautiful aspects. So it's not like um, and and it really looks tremendous. And most of my guests um, who came back in September, they really appreciate the effort we have made, like really segregating the tables. Every single table is a, is a little. Is a little cocoon which is protected by this drapage, and um, and I think it created an extra um, point of interest to start with. Uh, it looked good, so it really blend into the decoration of the restaurant, and and I think it makes majority of my customers feel safe. Obviously, I've had some guests who came and felt, you know, the tables were still too close from each other. Uh, they felt uh, we could have taken more care into. Um, but, but you know, it's always difficult to please everybody in this industry. But I think the, 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 the majority um, could really feel like we, we are made an effort. Coming into lockdown two, whatever, you know, this just <laughs> all disappeared. You know, it doesn't matter whether we make as much effort as possible. The government said, no, restaurants, this is where people probably uh, get infected and we are going to close you. And uh, that was really unfair. Uh, but, you know, c'est la vie, c'est la vie. We just have to, um, to to live with it. Looking at um, the, the the festive season, I love uh, Kerry's um, idea um, of celebrating Christmas when when everybody has been vaccinated, and maybe next year there is a two uh, Christmas uh, uh, within uh, within three months. That would be really wonderful. I think that's a brilliant idea. I just wish you would not have told everybody because uh, everybody is going to have that. <laughs> Extra <laughs> newsletter on the marketing, the marketing material when we reopen. You know, thanks to Gary for reminding us that we can actually make a lot of money now. We're not going to do January. We are going to do a tasting menu, and you are going to spend fortune. Uh, I, I think that's brilliant. That's that's exactly what um, uh, uh, our industry is: creative. You know, thinking about the experience of the customers. And uh, if we can't celebrate Christmas in in December, yeah, well, celebrate in June, and uh, even better. Hopefully We're we'll coming be able to yours in January. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. Hopefully we'll still be able to play Christmas music in January if this happens. Um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, Roz, um, did you notice anything in diner behavior um, coming into the first lockdown? Sort of, what were some of the things you saw a change with the diners, and what do you expect come the festive season? Obviously, it's a different time of year. People are going to be even more excited to go out. Um, do you think that's going to affect diner behavior uh, for better or for worse? I think in general, most people were very, very understanding of, you know, what it was to reopen uh, after a pandemic or during a pandemic. You know, nobody, nobody's done this before. There's no, there's no one that you can go to and ask what to do, how to do this. You know, so I think everybody was learning on their feet making it up as they went along, you know. So I think as long as you were very open with everybody, I think, you know, I think most people in general, 90 whatever percent were were definitely wanted. I think people were just so glad to be allowed out. Of course, you had, you're always going to have people that, you know, that, that table is a little bit too, or that table is talking to the other table. At, you know, we can't please everybody. But as long as you showed that you were going over and above, and I think this is where, where I kept on saying, this is not the time to, to, put, to put your heels down. This is the time to keep everyone very polished, over deliver, making sure that, you know, you are clearly visibly showing that you're keeping, you know, you're keeping care of the premises. You know, things are going, you know, there's not dirt or, you know, you're just on top of things. I think people will, will buy, will buy into that confidence. If you if you're going about it in that right manner, then you know, you're gonna you've got to make people feel comfortable. 
And I think in general, hospitality, we always do. You know, we have to, you know, we have to work under very strict guidances anyhow. So I think it was a natural thing for us to be able to do. And I think if you've got a strong team around you, they and, and certainly for our, for us, we're, we're very lucky that we, a lot of our teams have worked together for years. Um, so it was something that they could pick up very quickly and do it quite confidently. And, and ultimately, that, that meant that we had happy guests, really. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. Good, good, good. Any other thoughts before? I want to spend the last about 10 or 15 minutes on marketing and PR, but any other thoughts on uh, in restaurant dining before we move on? Great. Yeah. Um, so this is where, you know, I'm hoping for some more secrets, hidden gems. Carrie, you've already given one up. Uh, hopefully you're willing to give up a couple others. Um, but um, love to just get a better understanding of sort of some strategies that you sort of doubled down on during the pandemic because you thought that they would really work or new things that you're trying. So. Carrie, let's start with you. I know we talked a lot about journalists and social influencers. Tell me a little more about your thinking there, pre-pandemic, during the pandemic. <clears throat> so pre-pandemic, we would have and invite journalists in to review, you know, some of the restaurants and bars. And what I noticed then is that they would maybe review in, in January, maybe it would only be published in April. And then having come out of lockdown and we're reopening and we're now re-looking at our marketing strategy, you know, what journalists, what Instagrammers. One of the things I noticed, which was really different from the time before, is that journalists are kind of, I think, in my mind, regarded more as being truthful. So Instagrammers are selling you what they're paid to do or they're there to, you know, experience the restaurant. Journalists do a black and white review. And what we found is that the journalists that came here to review the hotel and the restaurants in you know coming out of a lockdown those were published you know one or two weeks later so people were reading the reviews and understanding actually this is what the restaurant looks like outside of lockdown and i think it gave people confidence to come back to the hotel because they'd read a review where actually yes the tables are spread out no no it's not sure of the time before and i think for us you know, getting, you know, an article in the in the press maybe one or two weeks later after you've been reviewed, that made a huge difference to us. And also having influencers come in and do articles or do Instagram posts that the restaurant looked like now. That made it a huge difference for us. And I think it gave my customers confidence to come back in because they knew what they were going to be expecting to see. Mm -hmm. That's great. Great. Alexis, I know... Um, we talked about Facebook campaigns. I'm not sure if you did those before, but uh, you had a you had a great story about sort of how you tweak your Facebook campaigns. Um, yeah, uh, the obviously, um, I think this 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 pandemic and how we how we come out to it um, uh, has really pushed us in the 21st century. As as I mean, as far as concerned, as a as a Old, old school restaurateur, old school French chef, and, uh, and not really wrapping what was happening out there. Um, I've been pushed into, uh, into you know, being, being forced to look at what's happening. And you're talking, Kerry, about, um, um, you know, Instagram influencer and, uh, and all of that. Talk to me a year ago about that, and I would tell you, you know, this is, uh, this is not, uh, nothing to do with us. Um, I did not realize, too, that there was a life um, on the on the Facebook world, um, actually, most of my customers, um, yeah, you know what, they have a Facebook profile. Most of my customers, they actually spend quite a lot of time uh, on their Facebook page on a daily basis. And when I was on ties to um, start promoting, you know, whatever we are going to do um, with my with my uh, with my home kit uh, box, um, I put it on Facebook, and I just could not believe how how, how people were actually responding to it. Suddenly, I was talking to them directly through a, a social media platform, and uh, you're going to take me for dinosaurs, but I did not think there was um, that much possibilities, and the possibilities are endless. Say, this week, I spent, I don't know, I'll give you an example, 200 pounds on a campaign I'm going to do on Facebook, and I've been um, really like dividing uh, the kind of people I want to attract, those who don't know me, those who know me, those who are interested in vegan food, those who are interested in gastronomy, those who are interested in saving the planet, 
And I can really now understand who is going to actually press the buy button when they see my product. And this is so much more information than I've ever had. And it really helps me as the owner of the business, but also my colleague James, who is the marketing director for my business. And, 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 and I feed him all the information I have, and he feeds me back his expertise. And like that, we can really create some amazing campaign and grab and talk to people who have never heard about us. So if anything, this lockdown has put the hospitality, or at least my business, into, into a world which I did not um, uh, thought existed. I was in my little bubble, and I didn't realize I need to get in another bubble and get in another bubble in order to, to attract and push and, and for people to be aware of my, uh, of my product. And, um, and, and it's, when it works, it's fantastic. It's such a wonderful feeling. It's like having a food restaurant. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's, 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 really, it's really positive. And I will, I will urge everybody to look at, you know, maybe the number of likes they have on, the, on Facebook. Maybe there is something else out there than, than Facebook. Uh, I mean, uh, obviously, um, um, uh, Instagram is, is somewhere I, I, you know, I thought only my daughter was looking at Instagram. But no, 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 no. My customers, too, they are on Instagram. My customers, they sit at home for one hour a day, and they are going to go through all the, the food pictures they can see on Instagram. And funny enough, I put a picture of um, maybe the restaurant dining rooms looking beautiful at night. I get 100, uh, 200 uh, likes. I put a picture of a beautiful cabbage, and I've got 1,000 likes. So this, I need to learn from that. I need to learn from that. Who, who is my, who are the customers who are interested in my product? And thanks to new technology, I know. But I need to digest it and I'm being helped here. But it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful. It's really wonderful. Yeah. And the story you told me, I remember, was uh, one week you sold about seven meal kits on Facebook. And then you added a simple search term or group, solar, people who love solar energy. Yeah, because right. you thought yeah, it was similar, right. to, um, similar to you know, people who want to uh, eat vegan and whatnot. And I think you sold, what, 17 the next week or something like that? That's correct. That's correct. Um, that, that was another uh, moment of uh, enlightening. It's being able, as I said, to target the right people and what their interest is and really offering them the product they were actually wanting. They didn't know they wanted it, but you've, you've got the product and you have, thanks to this new technology, we have been able to put it in front of them. And, and, and this is research and finding and really, really fine-tuning your uh, your marketing, but I can tell, also tell you that one week I just had a zero on my marketing campaign, and the number of uh, of purchase from my wow. guests they had a zero as well, which is amazing. So it's actually scalable. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to give you all the special <laughs> recipes. <but laughs> I want people to get it. but <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I think it's, uh, it's if I, I'm not uh, if I can find out, everybody can find out, and don't be shy, don't be lazy, just go into it because there is. The money is there. Yep. Uh, Razak, uh, you had mentioned sort of the meal kits in our discussion, sort of the engagement with the, with the diners, right? Because you're sending them a package, and this is true with the three of you, that's, you know, 75% complete. So they have to finish it at home. Tell me more about the sort of the social engagement that you saw and other tactics you're using now. Um, well, again, we saw um, uh, Facebook was definitely – you know, even though you get a lot of likes on Instagram, but for some reason, Facebook, we were getting, that was converting more into sales, should we say? So, and more engagement. I think you, you're certainly getting more likes, but definitely more engagement with Facebook. And I'm just wondering whether that's because our, we're trying to work out why that was really. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still, um, I'm still learning digital marketing myself and, uh, you know, have people around me. But I think that uh, potentially our, our clientele are slightly the sort of 35 plus. So potentially it's theirs, it's the social media platform that they go to rather than that. And we, and we, we, we concentrated quite heavily in um, with paid advertising once, once, once we've got up and going, just so we could spread out a little bit and try and target new audiences, because obviously your your sort of loyal customer base are there, they're always there, but then after a while, you know, you've got to try and keep pushing out. And that's why, you know, we really started looking into a lot of Facebook advertising and that, you know, and that did really well. And then, and we just make sure that everybody, we encourage everybody to share all their setups, you know, when they're getting the boxes, the meals, the occasions, 
what the finished product looked like. And we, 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 we would happily tag that and share that. And I think, you know, and I, and I, and I, and I gave it a nice sense of community that, um, that everybody was sharing, really. But yeah, definitely something that we are pushing more with rather than the old way of sort of PR journalists, bloggers. I think certainly coming out of that, we've stopped, kind of tried to do things a bit more our own rather than the, mm. the, the, the other way, should we say, a bit more organic. Yes, you know. that's great. Yes, that's great. I think that's the word. <laughs> uh, well, I want to sort of end on one last question, but before I do, I want to encourage you all who are still listening to uh, please enter any questions that you have. We've got a couple of really good ones already, uh, but now is the time to input those in. We're going to leave uh, some time at the end after I ask this final question. Um, once again, just go to the Q&A engagement uh, tool, please. Um, so, Roz, one of the things that resonated with me in our initial conversation was a quote where you said, during uncertain times, we need to look at every opportunity. Um, and that's true with all of you. I, it, same sort of optimism and sort of opportunity uh, was consistent with all of our conversations I've had. Um, in 2008, during the recession, both you and Alexis actually opened restaurants when most people probably thought you were crazy, right? But you saw something there that others didn't and you took it and um, that's a reason why you're so successful today. So I just want to end this conversation by asking each of you, um, you know, what general advice would you give our listeners, the operators who are listening in, um, who are all sort of facing various stages of lockdown? What what sort of pep talk can you give them, right? Because I, I promised that I you'd share your optimism, which you already have, and your secrets. But what's the final word that you can share? Um, should I start? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I thought it was for us, but um, I, will, I, will, I will start. Um, um, I mean, obviously, running a restaurant or any hospitality is, 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 um, is, is it has to come from the heart. And, um, and if anything, um, a pandemic like that and, uh, and, and the problem we are facing, they are not, um, not going to kill us. But it's, it's, it's so important that um, everything we do, we, we do it with our heart. And we do it with uh, the, the true belief that we we are delivering for our guests. And uh, and whatever happens, as long as you do it with your heart, I know for sure that at the end it's going to be well received, and you are going to get compensated for that. Um, um, that's what I said earlier on. Do not go into hibernation. Show that you care, and show that your business, whether it's a massive business or whether it's just a little restaurant like mine, it's it's your baby. And everybody who's correctly looking after a baby will will <laughs> will succeed. And actually, the baby will succeed. Um, it's it's a pandemic. It's a problem, um, but it's not it's not the end of the world. I mean, we are not in uh, in Syria, you know, fighting and hiding from the bomb here. We are. We there is a future. We need to think about the future. We need to think about how wonderful the future is going to be. And everything we can't do now, we'll be able to do it in the future. So. I don't want anybody to feel down. Uh, or, or I know there are some people they may be uh, under a lot of uh, financial pressure, and they, but but if you stay positive, and if you believe in your product, it will it it will be good at the end. There, 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 everything will be fine at the end. I am I have got no 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 problem with that. It will be fine at the end. That's great. Thank you, Alexis. And I always think, you know, this is a perfect opportunity to invest into your business, you know, like anything, you know, when things are on the way down, you know, they're, they're always going to have to come back up. So this is the time to put back into the business, potentially into new opportunities, into that refurbing that kitchen, whatever, you know, getting it whilst, whilst it's down there. So hence when that curve comes back up, you're you're there. You're ready. You're you're ready for that explosion. And I think that's where, you know, a lot of people will cut 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 at this point of time, where we will look at um, trying to kind of invest and kind of trying always staying ahead of it. And I think that that's the difference. I always think that this this is the time to invest even more rather than cutting back even more time. So, um, and hence why you know we. Uh, you know, being being in hospitality, we all take gambles anyhow. So I think you always have to gamble that a little bit harder when <laughs> at times like this, <laughs> you've got to you've got to go for three sixes, not just two sixes. 
<laughs> get you through. But, you know, that's what makes us do what it is. We love what we do. We're willing to sacrifice and we're willing to take those risks. And I think if you get, get that calculated risk right in this time, you know, you'll be at the top of the curve when things get to open up and hopefully you'll kind of get to um, see the rewards from it with any luck. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, you want to end us on this before Q&A's? <clears throat> okay, my... Um, advice would be flexible, be open-minded, have options A, B, C, and D ready for December, Christmas, January, and just lead into it. What will be will be. You know, if if we all knew now that Christmas was absolutely full on, we'd all be planning like crazy uh, people. But we just don't know. So just have that open-mindedness and be flexible into it. You know, I think everyone can think about having some different options. I certainly am. And especially we're celebrating Christmas in January. <laughs> we'll be there. Yeah. Can't wait. <laughs> this was uh, an amazing conversation. I really appreciate it. The three of you, like I said, hopefully others could feel the warmth and the hospitality just jumping through the screens here. I wish we were all in person. I'd be toasting you uh, with a glass of champagne. Uh, so thank you. Um, had a couple of great questions come in. So I want to spend the last couple of minutes uh, for these questions. Luckily, they're for you, not for me. So I'll just start going through them. Um, leading on January, actually, Carrie, we had a question. Do you think wellness, dry January, or veganary will be as big in January as it usually is? Or do you think people would just want to continue celebrating, as Carrie said? I think if we come out of lockdown and we go into tier three for another four or five weeks, I think people will have their crazy few days of Christmas. But I think if I haven't seen my friends all of December, I think I will definitely be going out in, in January and I won't be having a dry one. So <laughs> I know that a lot of um, cases that I recently read have, you know, you know, have been advising that since we've gone into lockdown, people's um, patterns of eating have changed to far more healthier. So I think there's the flip side where actually, you know, there could be the opportunity for people to have much more healthier food in January. But I'm just skeptical in the case that if we don't get to have December, we will certainly carry on in January. Or I'm hoping we will anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> No, I think definitely people are living for the moment at the moment, given the, the opportunity, and they'll be they'll be out. So yeah, I think January. Um, hopefully, people will still be celebrating <laughs> a late Christmas. Alexis, any um, thoughts? Yeah. I should just 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 slightly. Um, of course, I I I'm no I'm no doctor, or, 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 but I'm a, I'm really I'm really concerned still that um, um, comes December and January and perhaps up to end of February, things are not going to be back to what they used to. And I think the, the real Christmas season might be into the spring this year and, and nothing, nothing up, to, uh, up to the end of February. That's, that's, that's my feeling, um, especially with the good news we had yesterday about the, 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 the vaccine. And um, it would be foolish, I think, to just reopen the gates and to let everybody go and infect everybody else <laughs> uh, before everybody gets uh, the vaccine. And then, uh, you know, we will have lost people um, um, just for two months, uh, you know, or three months of a slightly uh, tight uh, or tighter lockdown. So I think to be realistic, I think things are going to be uh, super positive come March. And I think this is when, uh, Kerry, we are going to celebrate Christmas this year. But up until then, I think people are going to, even if we, if they are allowed to go out, they are going to say, look, I, I'd rather wait until, you know, uh, things are getting better and people are getting uh, vaccinated and then and then they will, feel, they will feel a lot more comfortable, a lot more, you know, at ease to sit nearer, to have a good fun and to start drinking and to be closer to each other and, and to have fun, you know, <laughs> which, which is what it should be great. Personally, if I'm like most diners, I'll be celebrating all year. So yeah. uh, you all have that to look forward to. <laughs> um, yeah. Next question. Actually, I love this question because we haven't really talked about staff that much and they are so critical to your business um, and, and perform that hospitality, uh, whether it's putting care into those meal kits or whether it's when someone's in the restaurant, as we know. 
So, so someone asked, would love to know top tips from you all about how to how you motivate and maintain the inspiration with teams. Spill your secrets. Um, uh, my my sommelier is now my sommelier, my one waiter, my head wine waiter is is now the um, the, the person in charge of the um, dispatch. Uh, our maitre d is now the person in uh, in charge of organizing all the um, uh, weekly um, uh, boxes and uh, and everybody has been uh, has been allocated um, a new job, even though they are here just one day a week, uh, one and a half days a week. They all have new um, uh, new titles. And they are all, everybody, because uh, uh, I, I really make sure that everybody stays in the restaurant. Everybody is part of, um, of, this, new, um, of this new concept or this new, this new thing. So I think the key is to make sure that um, you, I know, I, I know Radak, you, you, you always talk about like people have been working for you and, uh, and, uh, and they, they, they have shown a lot of uh, enthusiasm with your, with your new product. And I think that's, they, 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 they they, they reflect who you are and, uh, and they want to be part of it because they want to be part of the, the, the baby you are, you are looking after and, they, and influencing and inspiring your staff is, is a must do. It's a must do because it's nobody's fault and certainly not their fault. And one more thing is no business should receive furlough. You know, this is something we've got in, uh, in UK, in Standard Olympia, <laughs> but it's a help from the government. No, no business who receive furlough should be allowed to fire the staff they have received furlough for when the, the, the lockdown is, uh, is over. I think that should be a condition because they are, you know, I think it's, it's terribly unfair, terribly unfair. I think if you get the help from the government, you must keep your employees. That's, that's, and I'll see having this kind of conversation with your employees really make them realize that, you know, they don't work for someone that they work for someone who really cares and they are part of the business and reminding them is key, really key. Yeah. And I think also teaching them, reminding them why they got into this, you know, because I think everybody has their up and down days and low days. And I think you've got to concentrate on the good times, the reason why they enjoy the service, the R&D, that rush from a you know, seeing happy customers. And I think you've got to take those little good thoughts and just keep reminding them why we're doing this, you know, and hopefully, you know, trying try to bring it a little bit back into the kitchen whilst you're working at it. And, um, you know, and hopefully it won't be too long till we're back open. <laughs> Fingers crossed. I also think it's really a key factor is that people work for people. So I think, you know, when the team come back together that, you know, we are all laughing, joking, and we have that sense of camaraderie. And I think one of the biggest things that's worked for me is that we, across my entire team, you know, when we're in the hotel, we all have different hats on. So maybe we have a, you know, maybe I'm not familiar today, maybe I'm KP today, and actually we're all here just to help each other out. And I think that makes, you know, a team come together where, I know you've changed some of their, their titles, but for me, it's like we're one team. So you're going to have to be who we are going to need to be today. And, and that's the way it's going to have to roll. Um, but also just keeping, you know, it's just so nice to be with other people and chatting again and, and, and working in our environments because that's what we miss the most. Yep. Yeah, I think there's really, in talking to a lot of you, uh, sort of the cream rises to the top. The situations like this, you really see who is in it for the hospitality and has, has that passion and others, and there's no fault for them, but you know, have chosen to go a different direction. So I think it's just been really interesting. It's always about the leadership at the top and the, and the tone that you're setting. So I think that's, that's exactly, exactly right. Um, got another question here. Uh, if you think about some of the ways you have pivoted your business during lockdown, do you think you would continue with any of these initiatives alongside your conventional restaurant business once we return to normal? Will there still be a diner appetite for delivery Cook at home box, for example. Yeah, I, I think so. Yep, yeah, sorry. I think there will be. I think, I think there will be um, people's uh, change. Uh, people's eating habits might have changed for some time. I think there'll be some people that are going to be scared to go back. I know there's certainly not everybody who's gone back to restaurants straight away. So I do think there is this eating at home 
um, is suddenly hit stage, and I think uh, we're, we're 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 only at the start of something. So, but yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Well, I'm not sure whether we'll we can, unfortunately with our restaurants we can't we can't do both at the same time. We just don't have the facilities to do service and that. We would have to invest into an, another kitchen to do that. But um, we'll have to see what the businesses are like, really. But yeah, I think hopefully these are here today, and you know, and I know this. Lots of money being invested into this, really, yeah, to to hopefully as another as another alternative to Deliveroo, but hopefully with much better chefs and amazing chefs and a much better standard of food than uh, what you get on the other platform. Really, not to say that you don't get great foods, <laughs> but you know, hopefully, um, yeah, hopefully, I'm sure this will uh, take off really. Um, I, I definitely think that uh, something that's going to stay uh, for a long time because um, it's 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 a new product. Um, um, it's it don't, the product demands just to be even more um, uh, developed. I mean, there is no limit how we can take the dream of my restaurant to any dining room in the country. I mean, there is there is the the, the it's limitless what we can do. We can bring. The delicious food, but maybe we can bring something else. Um, the music you hear at the restaurant, uh, the smell uh, in the candle of the, the you have at the restaurant. Uh, there is so much you can actually develop. It's limitless. I I think it's a it's a new avenue, new revenue stream, but also a new way for us to show our creativity and to take the the what we have created in our restaurant to people. So definitely, this is going to stay. And we are going to have people who are going to be, become experts into that. And uh, I can't even start to imagine restaurant that never existed, but you can actually bring into your uh, your home. Restaurant who have died, and you can resurrect them, and you can bring them to your home. Restaurant in Washington, they can actually be delivered in uh, in, in Soho or in, in, in London. Um, you know, I, I think there is no limit. It's, it's um, yeah, I mean, that's a human being. You know, faced with a with a problem, not only uh, we we resolve it, but on the top of that, we um, we we make an experience of it, and, and, and we we all we all it's it's wonderful for the creativity. <laughs> here. I very much agree with what you've just said because we've learned how to do our experiences from the restaurant into our hotel rooms. But the next stage will be when a guest is not staying in the hotel and would like that experience at the home, whether that's a chef, a butler, and a waiter. I think it will be very interesting to see what comes out of that next year. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Wonderful idea. Yeah, I can't see a better thing. Yeah, that's, that's really exciting. Really exciting. So I, I've Sorry, got time to one more question. Oh, hey, Rod. This wouldn't be a, a this wouldn't be a webinar without some sort of interruption from kids or dogs. Usually it's mine. So um, let me just end, end on one last question that I think is a great one to end on that someone asked. Um, is there a fellow restaurateur or chef who you think is doing an amazing job now during the pandemic? And if yes, who is that, and why? Why do you think that? Ooh. <laughs> um, um, yeah. Uh, uh, who is doing very well um, as a chef? Uh, uh, Gordon Ramsay seems to be on my TV almost every night because in the past I used to be in the restaurant and now every night I switch on TV. Is either on my TV or on the CBS uh, Atlantic? Or... So I think he's doing very well, but nothing to do with the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> now, but to be honest, if there is um, uh, uh, in, I, in, in France, because I, I, I look at what um, what my, my, my fellow chefs are doing in France, and all, they have been hit by the pandemic there. And I know that my, my you know, the, the, the person I, I trained with, uh, uh, Alain Ducasse, um, uh, from, from, from the cuisine of all the top hotels he has in, in Paris, he has managed to um, actually really recreate the experience of the restaurant in people's home in Paris. And not only he does that, but it, every single meal he does there is a little note from one of his head chef. It's being delivered by one of his waiters. So can you imagine the guy comes with the outfit from the hotel, ring at your bell and said, I'm here to deliver you. And for me, that's uh, 
that's really that that show, you know, the the what a three Michelin star chef can do in his restaurant. Well, you know what? During the pandemic, he can duplicate that and and bring it to people. So that's that's where I that's that's how I look. You know, that's I look up to him and uh, and he, and he showed the way. So for, for me, that's that's my hero at the moment. Uh, Jackson Boxer for me, who's got the restaurant Orsay and Brunswick House. Um, I think he was the first one to get a to get a. Hey, hey, hey Zaki, Zaki, no, 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 I'm, I'm just working. I'll be two seconds. Two seconds. <laughs> um, who, I think, uh, who got the first um, uh, review by Marina Loughlin? Uh, no, I'm just working. Can you get downstairs? Oh, two, yeah. two seconds. Two seconds. <laughs> I knew this would happen. This sort of kind of tense in the it. background. But yeah, I think that, you know, I think he was very I I inspirational during the first lockdown. Oh, and I think um, uh, Jason Atherton is just about to start a new um, lockdown with, uh, oh, yeah. uh, with Michelle Rue with oh, Lake yeah. District Farmers. <laughs> So this should be quite interesting to watch them, what they're doing. Oh, hello. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, so that should be quite interesting to see what they come up with, really. But, yeah, it seems like everyone's getting on it. Sorry, excuse me. I do apologise. No worries, please. Thank you. you can feel free to turn off, Carrie. I don't know if you had something come to mind, but... um. I would just literally say the Barclay Hotel, um, who did food every day for the local, for the London ambulance crew. I think that stands out to me, um, and it was just so nice to see them put all of that effort and hard work into feeding those um, NHS workers um, and police um, and ambulance. And I thought that was an incredibly generous offer from the group. That's great. Well, I think that's Amazing. a perfect way to end this. Uh, great. Last question, uh, just reality for what world we're living in with kids running in. Like I said, it's usually mine, um, and I love that. But I just want to thank the three of you uh, so much from the bottom of my heart. I know how busy you all are. The fact that you took the time for today as well as the previous conversations we had and for all the people listening to take the time to listen to us, I really hope you got as much out of this as I did. So thank you so much for joining us um, and have a festive season, whether it's in December, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, or August. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.